The lore of Tower of God is in perpetual expansion. Of course, the more you progress in the story, the more you learn about its universe. And so, as I said back then in the very first lore video introduction, the lore video series is doomed to become obsolete. That's why, as promised, I'm going to make lore videos like this one regularly, probably at the end of each big arc, in order to update the lore, taking up point by point the topics of the basic videos, knowing that for this time since the lore videos were all written during the Nest arc, between chapters 485 and 500, there are things we learned during this arc that I'm not going to talk about since they're in the other videos. Finally, I'll be spoiling until chapter 550. Hi, it's Lillian, and it's been a long time since I said this, but today we're going to do a lore video on Tower of God, where we're going to talk about what we learned in the Nest arc. There is not much more to say about the functioning of the tower, except that we have been clearly shown in this arc that the administrators are all-powerful, because of the ease with which they create games that even the most powerful high rankers have to comply with and where even they can be put in danger, as we have seen with the game Every Man for Himself, God for All, in the Cat Tower. On the history of the tower we have an extremely interesting passage, and which is for me one of the most important passages of the arc in my eyes, it is what Nen Nen tells us in the flashback with Wang Wang and Yasracha where she says that at the base, the very first living beings of the tower were plants and machines. We should perhaps take this with a pinch of salt, because it is said in such a way that we are not sure if it is a truth or a very exaggerated legend, a belief etc. But for the machines it's very interesting because it reinforces the fact that the workshop is really present in the tower since the very beginning, because we can hypothesize that they are at the origin of these machines, and even if it's not, it makes us ask a lot of questions about these machines, who created them, for what purpose. As for the plants, it's quite interesting to think that the first men, of which Char is the descendant and who talked a little about it with Balm, were born from the plants, and are also called great plants because it's a play on words in Korean, the word Taiko also meaning origin. We also know that Char taught Balm some things about the first men, and that they are linked to the countries of the flowers of Doan as well, so we feel that SIU is teasing us a little bit about the future info on that. And finally, there is probably a connection to be made between this information and one of the walls on the first floor where we can see quite a few plants. SIU having said that these walls represented in some way the history of the tower. Anyway, I feel that we are starting to go deeper into the history of the tower. As for the 10 great families, if there is one about which we have learned a lot, it is of course the Lopobia family. I told you in the lore video at the time that we only knew two of the 20 branches of the Lopobia family, the grey wolves and the windbirds who we met at the nest with their leader, Tokoko. Well now we can add, even if there is no official name, the branch of spiders with white garment widow as branch leader, the branch of snakes with Yorari as branch leader, the branch of horses with Perseus as branch leader, and the branch of owls with Pudidi as branch leader. We also know a little more about the hierarchical structure of the family, because a new concept has appeared. That of the hatchlings, who are in fact candidates for the succession of their respective branch head. There is Sicarius on the spider side, Orari on the snake side, although he will soon be killed by the captain, and Mayer, Candidi and Haaland yes like the football player, who we don't really know which branch they are to succeed. Finally, we have a character with a rather special status, and who seems even more important than the status of branch leader, Kirin, who is the chief trainer of the army, and seems to be one of the most influential members of the Lopo Bia family. His importance can be seen in the way the other members of his family seem to perceive him, as well as in his great closeness to the head of the family, to whom he often talks about serious matters, such as the Leviathan. Whereas in comparison Perseus seems to tell us that only a handful of branch leaders have seen the face of the family head even once. Note also that Perseus says that he, Pudidi and White Garment are among the best branch leaders, but that there are still two members who are at a completely different level from them, perhaps Kirin is one of them. You can also note the presence of a branch leader that we see in the flashback of Yasracha and Wang Wang during the attack on Akrinak, but he is not named and we don't know if he is still alive at the moment, especially since branches can change and be absorbed by others, as was the case with Didiano's branch. Finally, to conclude the list of new known members of this family, we saw Yoreyo, one of the new divisional commanders of the 4th Corps, who got smashed by White in one chapter, and is now sleeping in the body of the other guy whose name we still don't know, and Lobi, a lion man beast we see in Yasracha's flashback. But if there is one character that you all remember, it is the family head, Lopo Biatromeri. He was the only family head whose name we hadn't been given yet in the non-canon lore, and his appearance was really amazing, but we'll talk about that in the Ark's analysis video. Oh and we also saw the mothership of the Lopo Bia family. And speaking of mothership, we could see, 
In what is a post-arc part of transition, the one of the Po Bidao family, named the Ark of Knowledge, on which we could learn a lot of things. Well, as far as members are concerned, we have the three bourgeois idiots, Lu, Enver, and Ragma. We have Bellerin, a ranker with a dream of greatness who seems to like Rachel, and who is also the second in command of the mothership. Po Bidao Mateha, an elite prison guard who is also part of the Ha family, as well as a number of members who are not yet named. And we could also see a bit of the atmosphere that reigns there, where reading seems to have a primordial place, as well as a kind of bourgeois milieu full of hypocrisy, in which Rachel seems like a fish in water. But that's not all, since we also learn about a new member of the Kun family, with Kun Devo Perez, whom Masheni brought back to the nest together with Asensio, whose version we had seen in the hidden floor, and another member of the Kun family who is going to liberate Hybrider and whose name and face we will not know. Generally speaking, if there is one thing to remember concerning the ten great families, it is that they are more and more under tension with each other, and that alliances seem to be created here and there, even if it is rather difficult to know what exactly is going on. In any case, we know that the Kun family has made agreements with the Lopobia family for the nest arc, and that the Pobidal family has clearly become belligerent towards Jihad. Finally, we know that the family heads have all disagreed a bit about what to do with Bam, but we'll have the opportunity to talk about that in a future video. We have not learned much about the princesses of Jihad, except that it seems possible for them to renounce their status as princesses and get married, since this is what Tromarai is trying to do with Bam. We are nevertheless led to believe that this will obviously be a source of great tension with Jihad, but that in view of the exceptional nature of the situation, with a marriage to an irregular, supported by a head of the ten great families etc., it is far from a case like the one of Anak Jihad, and that it could happen. Concerning the Jihad family, we could see in the conclusion of chapter 550 that Lopo Biaren, former member of Red, has now become a member of the Royal Guard. Also, we can quickly notice the presence of the famous captain, or captains, concerning the princes of the Red Light District, even if everything concerning them is, as usual, very vague. As for the army, it's quite complicated because we didn't have any point to know where we are now, but the 5th Corps is almost destroyed since most of its commanders are dead, and that Yasracha left with Yama and Doom after having faced Tromarai, and that he's going to die soon anyway. The 4th Corps has lost almost all its original members and was quickly replaced by temporary division commanders who were sent to die in the nest, because we were going to put others in their place after this battle anyway. Except that Kalavan, the old corps commander, survived, Liberic, the new one, also survived, some division commanders on both sides survived too, Hachionhi on one side, and the guy at the center of the spell on the other for example and so it's a bit complicated to know how all this is going to be reorganized. And finally, as far as propaganda is concerned, we know that the Empire has knowingly caused a lot of death in the nest by first sending a whole bunch of soldiers to be massacred, before bringing back the whole bunch of high rankers in order to shock the inhabitants of the tower, and to make the fug look like dangerous bloodthirsty monsters, who are evil incarnate, and who must be fought at all costs. And this strategy will be reviewed again against Akrinak, where they will first send beastmen, especially Wang Wang's dogs, and then send the branch leaders when they feel that there is enough damage. For the RAO, so the ranking of the rankers, we don't have any new information but we can speculate quickly on the fact that some of the characters we have seen are high ranked. White Garment, Hudidi, Perseus and Kirin for example, who are probably all in the top 100. And also, I can complete a little bit what I said in the top 100 video, about Tromarai, where we know now that his so-called ability to control humans is actually his ability to control beastmen. We also saw him use a spell to darken the surroundings we saw him control a whole bunch of Shinho that we'll talk about later, and we got a glimpse of his Shinwon Ryu, named All Creatures, which impressed us all a bit I think. We can also talk about Gustang who destroyed a whole fleet of Lopobia family by reading a book, just to light a cigarette. But I think it didn't surprise anybody to see him doing that. There is not much to say about the Fug, except that according to Doan, the slayers of his time were much less human than Karaka, much darker, and given the era in which they were forged, it's easy to see why. I look forward to seeing them in action in the future. Also of note is the fact that Akrinak had a slayer as a host before he had Nennea. As for Wul Song, there is nothing to say except that they gave Donghei to Huts after the workshop battle arc. And for the workshop it's gonna be fast too, because the only information about them is that they are at the origin of the creation of hybrid species, half man half beast, like Yasracha, Yama, or probably also other characters like Sia Sia. We can also note the fact that the workshop has very powerful members, since one of them has massacred all the rankers of the group that Yasracha had formed, and seemed ready to take him by force too. 
There is also the whole experience with Arya, Yorayo, etc. But I had already talked about it in the Lord video about them. We didn't learn anything special about the Shinsu or the positions, but there is one point I would like to come back to, because I think it's cool. It's about Leibrick's power and how Calavan uses it to increase his power tenfold. Basically, Leibrick will combine his Shinsu's primary property, water vapor, with his secondary property, electricity, to create a huge electric current. The problem is that in doing so he is going to electrolyze the water, that is the electricity is going to break the water molecule in two, which will give oxygen and dihydrogen. Problem. Hydrogen is an extremely combustible gas, which explodes very easily. However, the property of Calavan's Shinsu is precisely the explosion. So he will use all this hydrogen created by Liberic to increase his power tenfold by making it explode. In short, all this to remind us that different properties of Shinsu can be mixed and create interesting combinations. Oh, and we already knew that Bam was, by his nature of irregular, able to break any spell, but we also know with the whole passage of the liberation of the Leviathan that he is also able to open any seal, like a kind of master key. And we can also note the Shinwonryu of Tramurai, which has a rather particular form with all these creatures which go in all directions, and which shows us that each Shinwonryu is different according to the irregular who uses it. We discovered some new weapons or items, like for example the Lefaf Faust, which is just a kind of big rocket launcher of Lefaf. There is the Shield of White Garment Widow, Zubizareta, which is a pretty cheat shield given to her by Traumarai, so we can suppose that it is a pretty important item, and it is also a reference to the footballer Andoni Zubizareta, a Spanish goalkeeper in the 80s slash 90s. And finally there is another object belonging to Traumarai, a flute that can control snakes, and that Yul will use to control the branch leader Yurari in the crystal where the Leviathan was trapped. We don't know how he got this flute, but it shows us how much influence the captain has. We can also note the acid of the cat tower which was even able to kill rankers like Haracha. Ah, and in terms of weapons, we could see Hats igniting Donghei, and learn that this sword has killed quite a few people who tried to ignite it, including rankers, and that its power changes according to the will of its user. We didn't see any new floor, well we did but we didn't see any environment and we didn't know the number of the floor in question so we don't care. On the other hand we have a rather important place that we saw at the end of the arc, it's the scented snow garden, which is a particular garden where there is a place where the snow falls continuously. This is where Namo and Sora were trained, but the most important aspect is of course the fact that Arlen Grace lived here for a while, so maybe this will be an opportunity to learn something about her. We could see quite a few new Shinho in this arc, even if there are many of them that I already talked about in the lore video on the subject, since it spoil until chapter 500, so to complete we had, Candidi's purple urchins, the red-eyed owls as well as Dobo, controlled by Pudidi. Note also that he mentions the great horned owl that he did not take to the nest, but that he used against Akrinak, and that seems to be a very powerful Shinhu. There are also the Shinhu used by Harland which refer to marine species which are now extinct. Egerocassis which was a marine animal which appeared 520 million years ago, Camaroceros, which appeared 470 million years ago, Picaia, which appeared 505 million years ago, and finally Parapetoia, which appeared 530 million years ago. Then there are all those controlled by Traumarai. There is the venomous frog of cobalt color which became a deity after having ingested 10,000 snakes, which is a name much too long and that even Traumarai has the laziness to say in full, so we will do as he does and just call it cobalt. Then there are 23 giant monsters belonging to the Lopobia family. We had already talked about the giant cobra, which belonged to the 20th branch, that of the snakes. But this time we learned that 7 of these 23 giant monsters are under the direct control of Traumare. And among them, we have the arrogant kraken and Fandore Harp. And finally we know that in these 7 giant monsters, there are 3 sea dragons, and we saw one of them, rapid in rage. We can also note the two others that we see in the background, during the fight against Akrinak, a turtle and a wolf even if it is not said in black and white, that they are part of these 23 giant monsters. In terms of special species, there is Hybrida, who is an experiment subject that Jahad gave to Yasracha. Not much is known about this monster except that Yasracha experimented on him in order to prevent Traumarai from controlling him. Hybrida will finally be completely obliterated by Traumarai's Shinwonryu, while he seemed to be immortal during his fight against the guy at the center of Arya's spell, whose name is still unknown. There is of course Akrinak who is important to note. He seems to be one of the ancient species, like the one that have Kel Helm and Evankel as their host. As I said, all we know is that it had a former Fug Slayer as a host, then had Nen Nea without knowing too much about why, and finally that it took Yama as a host,
just before his mother died, who made Akronak promise to save him if he was in danger of dying. And finally there is Leviathan. Leviathan is I think one of the most interesting creatures we've seen since the beginning of Tower of God. When he introduces himself to Bam, Leviathan describes himself as a monster who had subdued all creatures in the tower including those from ancient times to his authority. But most importantly he says that this was also the case with the creatures outside the tower, indicating that he came from outside the tower as well, like the Irregulars, which explains why Tromarei cannot control him when he can control all the creatures in the tower. Leviathan then tells us that Tromarei is his creator, which would mean that Tromarei created him before entering the tower and then took him with him in his ascent. Except that Leviathan did not recognize him as his master, did not want to submit to Tromarei. Also we know that Leviathan holds part of the memories that Tromarei once got rid of, and that he then locked him in the crystal because of his insubordination. Leviathan will say that Tromarei will condemn him to feed on disgusting emotions, Probably referring to these memories, Leviathan will finally be absorbed by Bam and we will then have an interesting information. He was determined to devour everything in the tower, as if it was in his very nature. But when he found himself inside Bam, facing this immensity, he realized that the very existence of a being such as Bam in the tower ruined the reason of his existence. I refer you to my video on Bam's powers on this subject, but I think you know where SIU is going with this. Well that's it for this time we got a lot of info in this arc, especially since I only gave you half of what we learned here, since I already told you the other half in the previous lore videos which were spoiling up to chapter 485 to 500 roughly speaking. Now with this video, you know all the lore until chapter 550 and then we'll meet again for the next update at the end of the next big arc. Besides that, a video analysis of the nest arc will be released soon so like it, comment it, subscribe it, all that, and until then be well.